the Brussels Report podcast. Welcome to a new episode of the uh, Brussels Report podcast. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Kleppe. I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, BrusselsReport.eu. And I'm an, I, I am delighted to have as my guest uh, Chris Snowden. Uh, Chris is the, the um, head of lifestyle economics at the British Institute for Economic Affairs. Uh, this is a, a very important think tank in the United Kingdom. I would say the flag bearer of um, classical liberalism, of uh, advocacy in favor of free market uh, policy uh, solutions. They have played a massive role in preparing uh, the Thatcher revolution. Uh, unfortunately, the trust revolution has not materialized. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the IA is also uh, interested in the policies of other countries outside of the UK. And every year they come up now already for the seven years with um, the nanny state index, uh, which basically measures um, to what extent uh, European countries engage in paternalism. Uh, in the end, also distorting uh, consumer choice um, while regulating private choices. So uh, welcome, Chris. That's oh, nice to be here. A very accurate introduction. <laughs> uh, so maybe, yeah, you could introduce a little bit and explain what the findings are of the, of the index uh, this year. Sure. So um, we have 30 countries in the index. We actually have um, Turkey in the index for the first time. Okay. Uh, we've expanded it a little bit in the last few years. We also have Norway in there, which wasn't in there when we first started. Um, and actually, Turkey uh, is at the top of the table and Norway is second. Um, so you've got two very different countries there, but with um, similarly paternalistic policies. And then towards the bottom of the table, in other words, the more liberal countries, <laughs> you have places like Italy, uh, Czech Republic, Germany, Luxembourg, Spain. You get a lot of the more Mediterranean countries there. Um, and at the top below Turkey and Norway, there's Lithuania, Finland, Hungary, Ireland. So a real mix of countries, you know, there's mm. no real pattern between them. I mean, I guess in Turkey and Hungary, you have two slightly autocratic nations. Then you have Norway and Finland, which are your classic Scandinavian paternalistic states. Um, and then you've got places like Ireland, um, you know, Lithuania. There's quite a few Eastern European countries moving up the table over time. And the UK itself is in 11th place. Um, and so what really what we see... Um, is more or less the same kind of countries at the at the top and bottom of the table. But, but there is quite a bit of movement between them, and it's interesting and fairly depressing to watch the um, just the gradual increase in nanny state taxation and policy uh, across Europe. Um, there's very very few examples of liberalisation. I mean, the only major okay. liberalisation would be in, in Norway when it got rid of its sugar tax a couple of years ago. Mm. What about the uh, development in Germany? As far as I know, uh, there are plans uh, to legalize marijuana, but maybe that's not yet reflected in the index, I guess. Yeah, we don't have any drugs in the index at the moment. Um, oh, okay. Basically, okay. basically because they're all illegal everywhere, so there's not a lot of point. <laughs> I mean, there's, there are slight differences in how the law is enforced, and some countries have some kind of decriminalization, um, but we don't really include enforcement and decriminalization as... as um, criteria because we're just interested in what the law actually says so we do know for example in some countries smoking bans aren't very well enforced but that doesn't matter to us we just look at what the law says on paper mm. um so if we have more and more countries legalizing cannabis properly then it's quite possible we'll bring it in in a future edition okay and if there's let's say one um lifestyle choice that is um you know, specifically uh, singled out by governments across Europe, including Turkey, um, what would that be? Well, the, we see the most regulation and taxation when it comes to tobacco. Hmm. Um, but also, you know, in some countries, you see at least as much with alcohol. Hmm. Um, so there's been, a, I mean, Turkey is a good example. I mean, obviously, the, the vast majority of people in Turkey are, are Muslims and, uh, and don't drink. Um, so it's you know, pretty easy to bring in temperance legislation there. But you also see in places like Lithuania um, and some of the other Baltic nations a growing intolerance of alcohol. Uh, a lot of the Scandinavian countries have very, very heavy restriction of uh, alcohol advertising, but also a couple of them have a state monopoly on alcohol retail. Um, and we're also seeing more and more regulation of vaping. Um, and indeed of food and soft drinks. You know, the UK is, is second 
uh, just below Hungary when it comes to regulation of food and soft drinks. A lot of the countries don't have any nanny state regulation. Uh, of uh, food and soft drinks, obviously they have regulation. Of course, we don't we don't include normal consumer regulation as being nanny statist. And, and perhaps mm. I should define the term because maybe not everybody's yeah. familiar with it. Um, but uh, another phrase would be coercive paternalism. So the point of these taxes and the regulations are to deter adults <laughs> from engaging in activities or using products that the government thinks is bad for them, basically, um, and. So the purpose is not what a sort of normal economist would consider to be legitimate regulation in order to protect people from fraud or um, you know, misleading selling or something like that. It is specifically designed to get people to, to mend their ways, to change their behavior, because the government thinks these things are, are bad for them, which in the case of e-cigarettes is actually very debatable, right? I mean, mm, regulation yeah. of e-cigarettes is a tantamount, really, to encouraging people to smoke in practice because you're dealing with two substitute products. Nevertheless, some countries, such as the Netherlands, have been on a real, um, a real crusade against vaping recently. Denmark, too. We're starting to see plain packaging for e-cigarettes. We've seen a number of countries introduce bans on e-cigarette flavors, um, and in fact, this is the only area where the UK does quite well. The UK and Ireland haven't gold-plated the EU regulations in this area and um, have been fairly laissez-faire. And it has to be said that has resulted in, in quite good public health outcomes insofar as people are smoking less. Oh, and, and would you say that indeed the influence of the European Union is, is quite big uh, here? Or, or is it still mostly, um, let's say, a... Uh, um, a misguided uh, mindset uh, among politicians and member states? The EU's role is actually surprisingly small. Um, and that's okay. reflected by the fact that there's such a massive gap between countries like Lithuania and countries like Czech Republic and Germany. Okay. Um, you know, there wouldn't be that gap if the EU was harmonizing everything and, uh, and standardizing everything. So in practice, yeah, the EU has some laws in relation to tobacco and vaping. Um, and they are reflected in the index. So, you know, um, every country, for example, scores six out of 10 on advertising of e-cigarettes because the EU says that you, know, you, you can't advertise e-cigarettes in a whole range of media. But there's still scope for advertising in purely domestic media. There's no, no one is saying that governments have to ban advertising for e-cigarettes on the subway, for example. Right? So... Nevertheless, you know, lots of countries have extended that ban. And when it comes to alcohol, there's really no EU regulation worth mentioning, and the same with food and drinks. So um, actually, mm. the EU's role is surprisingly small. It's going gonna, it's gonna to increase. I mean, the, the EU yeah. recently banned heated tobacco flavors, and it may well oh, really? introduce the, a, Yeah. So I didn't can, know. You can, mm. I mean, what they call flavors is anything but tobacco and menthol. Um, that's an EU, EU ban. That's an EU ban that came in last oh. year, I think. Yeah. Wow. Um, but and also the, there is a possibility that the EU might bring in similar regulation for e-cigarettes, or might bring in an EU-wide e-cigarette tax. I mean, they have openly talked about that kind of thing. So mm. if that happens, and that, obviously that'll be reflected in the scores, we will see whether countries like the UK and Norway, which aren't in the EU, follow suit. But um, yeah, I mean, the answer to your question, the EU is not a massive driver of this stuff actually to date. But still, then um, uh, we had some uh, some debates at the occasion of um, World uh, Anti Tobacco Day uh, in Brussels uh, recently, and um, and people were particularly pitching the Swedish model. And I think if you look at the facts, if you want to uh, reduce the number of people dying from tobacco um, uh, or from from smoking uh, tobacco, uh, then it's sort of hard to deny how successful Sweden has been. And 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 here we see the interesting difference between, on the one hand, Sweden and the rest of the EU, which is that Sweden enjoys um, an exemption, a derogation from EU law, which outlaws uh, snooze. And specifically among Swedish men, snooze has been hugely popular. And typically there we can see that this demographic smokes a lot less than uh, their counterparts in other EU member states. So um, for me, it's really puzzling how little attention this gets, because I think everybody is concerned about uh, the high number of deaths, of cancer deaths in, in Europe. Uh, and, and we sort of have, a, we have a control group, just like with COVID actually, uh, the Swedes, 
Um, and uh, instead of looking at that, the European Commission is refusing to look at the evidence. And as you mentioned, they are, you know, uh, they, they, they are doubling down. They, are, they, are, they already banned uh, heated tobacco. Uh, they probably would, uh, will end up uh, trying to ban snoo- um, vaping as well. Um, so all these harm reduction alternatives are, are um, anathema here. Yes. I mean, if you were interested in evidence-based uh, public health policy or any kind of policy, you would surely look at the places that have achieved good outcomes and see what they're doing and try and emulate it, right? Mm. But in the nanny state index, Sweden comes nearly at the bottom, actually, for the tobacco score. It's um, mm. it's 26 out of 30 countries. And now Sweden has by far the lowest smoking rate mm. in, in Europe. It's a massive and a very obvious outlier. Um, but it doesn't have, relative to the rest of Europe, it doesn't actually have that much regulation. And one of the regulations it doesn't have is the ban on snooze, which, as you say, is absolutely fundamental to their success in bringing down the smoking rates without having to prod people and nanny them and, and, and meddle in people's lifestyles too much. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's been absolutely no interest, really, from, from people at the European Commission and the EU Parliament to learn that, that lesson. Um, similarly, that no one seems to want to learn the lessons from the UK, where we've seen a very steep decline in smoking in the last 10 years as okay. cigarettes have caught up, um, mm. or, or well, been, been taken up, rather. Um, so you can only conclude that you know, we, these guys aren't really interested in evidence-based policy. They're not really yes. interested in what works. And in the case of snooze, which is just off the table as far as I can see, even though mm. the, there is going to be a new tobacco uh, to, a tobacco products directive and that would be an opportunity for them to lift that ban, it's completely toxic in Brussels. Um, if you remember the whole John Daly affair from over 10 years ago, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, still, it's still going through the courts in Malta. The main guy who was acting on Daly's behalf is now dead. We may never get exactly to the, to the bottom of it. Um, but the, the gist of it was that, you know, Dali is accused of trying to solicit a bribe from the, the biggest snooze company in, in the world. Um, and mm. rather than pay the bribe, the company went to the EU corruption uh, agency. And um, <laughs> and the whole thing was, a you know, a, 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 a big scandal. Mm. Um, but they meant that the issue was more toxic than ever. So I don't think the EU is ever going to lift the ban. And also, it's it's kind of seen as being... Um, a sign that the EU is not infallible. It's, it, they would be saying we've made a mistake with this, and we we don't make mistakes, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I think unfortunately that's off the table. Fortunately, there are substitutes for snooze now: nicotine pouches, which are which are getting quite popular amongst people. Um, mm. They really work in exactly the same way as snooze. You put, put it under your top lip, and it delivers nicotine. Um, except there's no tobacco in it whatsoever. It's it's as near as you can imagine to being like a totally harmless tobacco um, nicotine product, right? And um, yet, it's still been, mm. uh, I think Belgium are in the process of banning it. Netherlands have just banned it for no real reason other than, you know, the, the, the flimsiest of reasons. You know, we don't want kids using it, you know, or we, we don't want people using nicotine, really, is what yeah. they're saying. Yeah, which is, of course, very addictive, uh, nicotine. But if it's not harmful at all, then you can indeed wonder uh, what's the, you know, wh- why should it be banned? Uh, let's maybe let's maybe move to to um, to um, uh, food food and drinks. Uh, it looks like uh, the EU is also quite keen to to get its hands um, on that kind of policy area and uh, obviously um, uh, push for a part. part- paternalistic proposal so um there's the the nutri score um uh you know saga wh- where the eu is trying to push uh what i would say is is, is very questionable science um some kind of uh, classification system nutri score um which basically uh, punishes the the mediterranean diet so <laughs> i think n- nobody would dare to you know argue that um the Mediterranean diet is, is unhealthy uh, from a scientific um, point of view, but yet um, the the EU seems super keen to uh, to try to you know uh, come up with a classification system that would um, uh, you know uh, recommend not to go for that diet, right? Or, or am I missing it? Um, yeah, quite possibly, but I mean, I mean, they're, they're not going to get away with it, are they? With so many Mediterranean countries in the EU, um, <laughs> you just you just can't see the likes of uh, Italy and Spain. Uh, giving into this so i don't know what the EU was actually going to achieve with um regulating food and drink from a nanny state perspective i mean you've kind of touched on one of the real problems with regulation in this area which is that the science is 
rather unsettled, or at least people are not sure what the science is. Mm. So you had the World Health Organization last month saying that actually artificial sweeteners are no good, they don't help you lose weight, and they might cause cancer. Well, the World Health Organization, along with lots of other governments, have been very busy in the last few years trying to get the food and drinks industry to put more artificial sweeteners in the food and drink and take the sugar <laughs> out. Um, so what are we going in five years time? We're going to find out that sugar is actually really good for us. You know, I think it's very <laughs> risky to to have you know continent wide or eurozone wide regulations based on science that could very easily change. Um, you know, next week. So. As yet, as I said before, so far the EU hasn't really meddled in um, in the food and drink area, and indeed most countries haven't really. I mean, eleven countries out of the thirty score zero um, on on food and soft drinks, and most of the rest of them score only a handful of points. It's only really Hungary and the UK um, and Turkey that have high scores on that, and that is largely because of taxation. Um, okay. The EU's brought in, uh, sorry, the UK has brought in a few silly uh, kind of. Uh, unprecedented uh, restrictions really on, on like where su- supermarkets can position their food and so on. So we had to create a new category for that. But it's mostly about taxation. And let's be honest, that taxation is mostly there to raise revenue from products that people are always going to be buying. Hmm. Okay. And then uh, let's discuss uh, alcohol. Alcohol seems to be the, the new tobacco uh, in the mind of policymakers. Um, so um, what's the evidence about, uh, apart from the 1920s, of course, uh, about uh, like a nanny approach towards alcohol? Well, what we've seen in Eastern Europe in particular is quite a lot of cross-border shopping, if not outright smuggling, mm. uh, as a result of governments getting too greedy with alcohol duty. So in the kind of the, the Baltic uh, zone, the Baltic region, Estonia um, in particular had a big problem. You've got a lot of countries in that neck of the woods, including Finland, where people are, are crossing borders to go to a lower tax <laughs> jurisdiction. And uh, if you suddenly put up the, the tax rates and actually you lead to your own people go to the, the neighboring country. And of course, the governments in the neighboring countries know this. So behind the scenes, there is a kind of discussion about, we, well, we, we do want to raise as much money from alcohol duty, but we don't want to start losing trade to our neighbors in Lithuania or wherever. Mm. So it's a classic example, actually, of the Laffer curve in action, um, where you know putting up the, the rate of tax actually ends up with lower tax revenues. Um, and so Estonia had to reduce her tax rates for that reason. But you know, one of the main changes since the previous edition in 2021 um, is that we're just seeing more and more taxes. Uh, insofar okay. as these things are, you know, public health policies, the governments are always the most keen on the ones that bring in tax revenue. So we're seeing more and more sugar taxes, more and more vape taxes, uh, alcohol and tobacco taxes have been going up because governments are skint. You know, they, they, they got into a huge pile of debt during COVID, if not before. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, at one point, they'll discover that hiking the taxes is going to re- reduce the revenue. <laughs> which, which is, yeah, uh, as I say, this is what's <laughs> happened, you know, and you yeah. see, you're seeing a bigger and bigger black market for tobacco mm. ac- across Europe. And the higher the tax rate, the bigger black, the black market really, really is that simple. Uh, and and I want to I want to return to alcohol. I, uh, I'm very proud that my own country, Belgium, um, uh, came out last uh, in, yeah. in uh, in an alcohol in t- tackling alcohol uh, through man- nannyism. Uh, now I'm not sure about the uh, alcohol addiction rate. Of course, alcohol addiction is a is a terrible problem, and and, uh, and there's no question about that. Uh, but w- would you say that uh, there's any evidence that sort of the nanny approach also fails to reduce um, alcohol addiction rates? Um, there is an an absence of evidence in that area and one of the interesting things about the the nanny state index is if you take the overall nanny state index scores and put it on a graph in line with um life expectancy there is no correlation at all so it's it's not as if the countries that have the the biggest worst nanny state policies uh at least have the benefit of healthier population they don't Mm, and it's mm. not as if people in germany and luxembourg are dropping dead all over the place because they haven't got enough nanny state regulation and if you drill down into the data and look at the the scores for tobacco there's no correlation in the smoking rate if you look at the scores for alcohol there's no correlation with per capita alcohol alcohol consumption, um, and I'd be very surprised if there was any correlation with the number, you know, amount of alcohol addiction, alcohol 
alcohol-related hospitalizations, alcohol-related deaths. And unfortunately, these things tend to be measured in slightly different ways in different countries, so we can't really do that comparison. But there isn't a correlation with alcohol consumption itself, which is the thing that these governments are supposedly trying to get down. Mm. Okay. Uh, maybe to conclude, um, will the UK perhaps, um, you know, because of Brexit, serve as some kind of um, an inspiratory uh, regulatory alternative to European countries, or, or, or um, is that too optimistic? That's, it's very optimistic. Um, it, we haven't really repealed anything as a result of Brexit so far. It doesn't look like mm -hmm. we're going to, you know, in the future. If, for example, the EU does go ahead with these. You know, crazy ideas um, restricting vaping, then the UK may well say, "Well, we're not going to do that." So you'll mm. see you'll see regulatory divergence because yes. the UK just decides not to do anything while the EU does. And I think sure. in practice that was always the most plausible hope for Brexit that we, we mm. UK wouldn't just follow blindly what the EU does. But there is no sign whatsoever that the UK. Um, is going to start being more liberal on these issues. On the contrary, it's going to get worse. We very likely have a Labour government in the next 18 months, and they've made it fairly clear they're going to be um, quite draconian. Uh, I've even talked about banning the sale of cigarettes outright, for example. <laughs> Imagine that. Well, okay, uh, let's leave it there. So thank you very much, Chris uh, Snowden. I think your last remark proves that uh, the, the that you and the uh, IEA uh, will be more needed than ever in the future. I'm afraid so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The Brussels Report Podcast.